a scholarship not only on race concepts, but on race realism and biological approaches to race. As today, he's going to be talking to us about metaphysical mappings, problems for race theorists, and human population geneticists. Beishan, welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be on this side of uh, Pennsylvania. Okay, here we go. Um, so I will start with a bit of uh, background to how I came into this research project um, and then really clarify the phenomenon that generated the research question, uh, clarify the question, uh, motivate the question a bit, the metaphysics question. So uh, I'll show you the importance of it. <coughs> um, give my answer to the question give an argument for my answer, clarify key terms of the argument, defend the premises, and then talk about implications for philosophy of race uh, and implications for practicing science. So this is a, a chapter that uh, will appear in a book I'm working on uh, called A Pluralist Solution to the Race Problem. <coughs> Been working on it for a, a bit. It got started after I graduated from Stanford. I uh, actually came back not to work with the philosophers, but to work with the biologists, even though I had a master's of biology from Stanford. But I was working actually with the taxonomists when I was a graduate student there. And all the while, my official master's advisor was uh, the population genesis, Mark Feldman. In his lab, they were actually working on new technology that just broke open uh, new and wonderful questions for philosophers of race. So I came back to really learn about that technology. Um, Noah Rosenberg was a PhD student under Feldman uh, when I was there and he left, uh, then came back, got hired back. Stanford has a way of bringing people back. And he was teaching a course during my fellowship year there. Uh, it was called uh, Advanced Topics, Human Population Genetics. I asked if I could be in the course, he said, of course, we're actually reading some of your stuff. I said, you're reading some of my stuff. <clears throat> and then sat in on the course and it really flipped my mind because I was actually there at Stanford to write a book on biological racial anti-realism. That was my approach at the time. That's what I thought was the right view. Uh, after taking the course, I actually flipped to a biological realism. And now I flipped to uh, pluralism. So I'll sort of uh, step through how I ended up where I am today throughout the talk. So for those uh, unfamiliar with population genetics, it's basically uh, applying or studying genetics at the population level. This is very useful for getting a grip on various questions and issues in evolutionary biology, uh, because then you can simultaneously study how species and other uh, populations evolve. So one thing you're going to want to do in population genetics before you get started on anything else is identify your biological populations. Now, if you there's a this debate in fossil biology, the species debate, what is a species? There's also a debate, what is a biological population? I'm publishing that. But um, so this is an important step in doing population genetics. Populations are understand, understood in various ways. Uh, but one way is to think of them as some kind of uh, groups that promote non-random non mating. So this is an example. Oh, you brought out drums for me. Thank you. <laughs> so this is, this is an example of some results from population genetics on identifying levels of what they call population structure within a species. Uh, this study actually came out of Penn. The last author is Sarah Tishkoff. She's a well-known human population genesis, but here she's working in primatology. <clears throat> and before they did this work, uh, everyone in primatology thought that there were these five subspecies within the common chimpanzee species, pantroglodytes. Uh, after the work, they thought that there was actually only three subspecies. So uh, the, the new technology that was being developed was very good 
at revising uh, previous ways of identifying uh, populations, especially identifying so-called cryptic population structures. <clears throat> so the old way of identifying populations and population genetics is what the literature is called distance-based genetic clustering. Um, so basically you start with either individual organisms or local populations or putative local populations. These are supposed to be your bedrock of populations, randomly mating groups of organisms. And then you identify some kind of genetic similarity, distance uh, sort of metric. FST genetic distance is a popular one. And then you do pair, oops. And then you do pairwise clustering back there. Then you do pairwise clustering. So, oh, you're more similar to this group. Okay, we'll lump you together. Then you use the metric again. This group is more similar to that group. Lump them together. You keep going up until you get a tree. Um, you do your error analysis, typically with robustness. You subsample. So you sample a subset of the genetic data. You try to create the tree again. Then you get sort of a frequency for each branch. And typically, 70%, 75% is what you consider significant. And you get this hierarchy of genetic clusters. <clears throat> so this is an example of the old method of identifying population structure. This is in the human species uh, from what I like to call the, the Bible of human population genetics, history and geography, human genes from Cavalli Soros et al. <clears throat> and uh, so they're using 42 putative local populations DEEM is a synonym for local population. Uh, the way that they do this in population genetics, at least for humans, is by um, assuming that ethno-linguistic groups, groups are going to be your local populations, which is testable. You can find out that's not the case in certain cases and revise your set. Uh, but there's over like 7,100 uh, such linguistic groups in the world, and they're spread throughout uh, the continents in various ways. So that's how you sample. Um, they looked at over 100 autosomal alleles, use FSC genetic distance to get the distance um, from each group. And then unweighted pair group using arithmetic method. They get the tree, they bootstrap analysis for the error. The new method, this was what was being developed in Mark Feldman's lab when I was over doing phylogenetics. Um, model-based genetic clustering, they're both really model-based. This is just this is, the, this is the terminology they use. Um, here, you are using organism with genotype data, and you relax. There's an assumption embedded in the, the distance-based method where membership in a population is crisp, right? You're wholly a member of one population at any given time. You're not partially a member of any other population at any given time. Uh, this, the Cavalli Sorbs et al. actually lamented that assumption uh, in the first couple pages of History and Geography of Human Genes, because then they had to limit their sampling of humans to what they call indigenous, sort of uh, unmixed populations of humans. Uh, and they explicitly said we couldn't include African Americans in our sample because it just, we just messed up the analysis, right? So if you wanted to allow for multiple population membership, fuzzy membership, uh, this could be a way forward. <clears throat> so what they do is they find optimal uh, K equals two partitions. So you're breaking up the species or larger group into two populations or putative populations. Technically, they're just genetic clusters. <clears throat> and you assign, you find the optimal one by basically using a way of sifting through the data to see which assignment of membership grades uh, gives you the highest probability of giving you the genotype data that you see. <clears throat> and you repeat this at K equals three and so forth until you can't go anymore. Um, you do a robustness analysis, like start over and try to do all the levels again. And um, there's various other technologies that are used to visualize the results. And you end up with a hierarchy as well, uh, but it's a fuzzy, a hierarchy of fuzzy genetic clusters. So this was the first example of this new way of identifying population structure uh, used on the human species. It came out, this is a figure from a paper that came out in 2002. It was the highest cited paper in science for about three years. 
The authors of this paper won a prestigious award in medical science because of the implications, the Lancet Award for implications for uh, medical research. Some of what's going on in the background. Oh boy, I really went too far there. Some of what's going on in the background is uh, this other software that Noah Rosenberg developed called Clump. Uh, you want to sometimes the uh, the labeling gets switched up across independent runs. Uh, you also want to have a way of finding replicates. Like if someone is 83% African versus 80% African across, is that the same result or not? What's the statistical? Score? So that's what Clump is doing. Actually, really interesting metaphysical questions here. <clears throat> but um, you get robust results, then you can report your result at each level. Uh, how to interpret these, um, these figures? Well, the non-Black vertical lines represent organisms. Right? Black vertical lines separate putative local populations as a testable hypothesis, but uh, typically they're going to be your ethno-linguistic groups. And then the color dimension actually gives you your um, uh, potential population. Right? Technically, genetic clusters, if other assumptions are satisfied, then you can call them population, biological populations. The way to interpret the non-Black vertical colored portions um, is it equates to the proportion of organisms, so-called genomic ancestry from the cluster, which is actually how specifically should be interpreted varies across the study. So it's literally the percentage of alleles that you got or the proportion of alleles that you got from that cluster, but how you're defining an allele could vary. Are they microsatellites? Are they indels? Are they single nucleotide polymorphisms? Um, so if you're doing say 23andMe versus, um, I don't know, ancestry.com, you gotta be a little careful. Look at the method. The results might vary simply because they're sampling different kinds of genetic information. Um, I love using this example because Elizabeth Warren gave us her uh, DNA results um, back in 2018. For some reason, she uh, submitted herself to this to appease Donald Trump. Uh, but she gave a whole, made a whole website. There was a PDF on that website that gave very specific data about the genomic ancestry of various chromosomal segments. Um, it doesn't exist anymore, but you know I downloaded a copy. Right, and I crunched the data, and this is how she would be positioned in Rosenberg et al. like studies. Right now, pretty early on, as early as 2003, population geneticists themselves started seeing a correspondence, a one to one correspondence. Uh, like Sarah Tishtoff and Kathleen, Kenneth Kidd uh, actually reported, say, Hey. That cake with five level kind of looks like the federal government's racial scheme. Uh, why were geneticists seeing this link? Well, these are mostly American geneticists. And as I'll talk about later in the United States, American geneticists are very familiar with the federal government's racial scheme because it's pretty much required of them to sample in this way in order to get NIH funding. NIH funds most scientific research in the United States, way more than NSF. So, because they're population geneticists, eyeballing isn't enough for them. So they do some quantitative analysis. Uh, they got together with sociologists. A couple of studies like this have been done now, where this one in particular is a randomly sampled American college students got their federal government racial self reports uh, from college applications, uh, blinded themselves to the self reports, did DNA samples, use structure. Uh, that was the algorithm that was used in the previous slide structure that was developed at Stanford Department of Biology. And they were able to, with 99% accuracy, predict what the self-reports were. And then they went in the reverse and they said, hey, um, maybe we can um, just use the self-reports and predict the majority genomic ancestry. They're able to do that too. So this is statistically significant, a very big surprise. Something juicy is there for philosophers to investigate. So I call that the uh, metaphysical mapping phenomenon. And, and to be specific, I'll say that this set of pairs 
um, is the one-to-one -one correspondence. And the question then, because the philosophical question then becomes, what's the metaphysical relation that's exemplified by this, this mapping? Pretty interesting question. <clears throat> so why would it be interesting to someone who does metaphysics of race? Well, there could be very different metaphysical relations that are exemplified there. Uh, some kind of function of grounding, co-extension, co-exemplification, a relation I'll talk about today called tracking, identity, Brian Epstein's anchoring, something like that. But also it could, could, should be of interest to scientists who have to use uh, the federal government's racial scheme research you might wanna know what exactly are these groups? Uh, that'll give you insight on how best to sample those groups uh, because currently we don't have any measurement theory for, for accurately or reliably getting information about racial memberships in these groups. So the thesis I eventually came to adopt is the identity thesis. So I think the metaphysical relation that's exemplified by the map phenomenon is identity. You wanna get nerdy about the kind of identity that I'm talking about and there it is. But don't ask me about it after I've had some whiskey. <clears throat> All right. So here's the argument. Basically, it's a Kripke style argument where <clears throat> if you're using referential meanings to model the meanings of the federal government's race terms, I'm just saying that, uh, say, the, the relationship of identity holds between, say, Asian and East Asian because the term Asian uh, directly refers to the human continental population, East Asian. That's the first premise. And then I'm just uh, asserting that the conditions of the antecedent of the first premise are true. Uh, the most controversial premise is gonna be the third one. I'm gonna spend the most time defending that one. But before that, I gotta clarify some important terms in the argument. First, what are these federal government races I've been talking about? I call them the OMB races, probably more precise to say the 1997 OMB races. But the OMB is the Office of Management Budget. It's the largest uh, office in the executive branch of the US government. They don't just handle the budget of the US government, they also manage the federal agencies. And since uh, the late 1970s, they took it upon themselves to manage the race talk of federal agencies. The US government has an official racial scheme. This is a very unique situation. Very few, I did this analysis um, a few years ago. Um, and Morning, a sociologist at NYU also did this analysis. Our analyses converged. It's very infrequent to have national governments uh, classify the citizens using race talk. Usually it's nationality talk or ethnicity talk across the globe in the United States. We have official race talk. And the presidential directive uh, that the official racial scheme was first communicated in uh, has this order for the federal agencies. Look, when you're collecting and reporting racial data among the US federal agencies, you don't have to use our racial scheme, but you gotta classify people in such a way that it's translatable into our racial scheme. Now, most federal agencies just use it in order to satisfy directive number 15. <clears throat> According to the OMB, the, the primary reason they, uh, gave themselves the power to control uh, federal agency race talk was linguistic. There was too much crosstalk across the federal agencies, the Department of Education, National Institutes of Health. They like to do it one way, they like to do it another way, couldn't share data. Right? Now they, they're forced to share data. Um, and that's connected to the second reason, it's like, look, we have all these lovely um, civil rights laws from the 1960s, say the fair, Housing Act from 1968, if you want to enforce that, that's 
It's supposed to be the job of the Department of Justice. They got to get that information from uh, housing and urban development. So they've got to have a way of communicating, translating data in a compatible way. Now we actually aren't using the racial scheme that the OMB gave us in the late 70s. They revised it in the late 90s because of immigration concerns. Lots of uh, different people had come to the United States within that 20 years. For example, the American Indian term picked out a group of people that didn't include the indigenous people of South America. And so you can come to this country from Peru and be you know, mostly catching in your indigenous ancestry you had nowhere to go, right? So that was a problem. And then interracial, they say interracial marriage, it's really births, like interracial reproductions. Uh, people were having kids in ways that made it hard to racially classify them. And that was also coupled with the fact that they didn't allow for multiracialism in the, in the 70s. Uh, so now that's an option, you can be mixed. Mm -hmm. So they say they want a, a, a new way of talking that's comprehensive in coverage. It's based on ancestry. They have all these aims that they want to achieve with their new race talk. Uh, one thing they did keep the same was that Hispanics were an ethnicity, not a race. That was the case in the 70s. We also have an official ethnicity scheme. It's Hispanic and non-Hispanic. That's it. Everyone, that's a comprehensive scheme. <laughs> You're gonna be Hispanic or non-Hispanic, but that's it. Yeah. That's what they did. Um, yeah, so now they have multiracialism. All right, so here is what the OMB in the revised directive in the late 90s gave as their so called definitions for each race term, as well as some of the um, what Kripke might call the original sample, uh, some, some of the extension of these, of these, of these, of these groups. And the CDC plus the US uh, Census Bureau has a huge list called the race code list. This is what your taxes are paying for. Huge list, every ethnicity in the, every, what do they call it? They call it an ancestry. I think they call it an ancestry group or something like that. Because the official ethnicity is Hispanic, non Hispanic. Um, they have them all in a numeric or alphanumeric code, right? You can sort of see where this, these things are supposed to be like. Right. <clears throat> now I'll say really quickly, these are the definitions of these terms. No philosopher of race has looked at this, thinks this, Asta, Michael Hardiman, all the folks who work on this. Uh, at best, they're reference fixing descriptions. We kind of get a good idea what the OMB is trying to do, but we don't want to say this is semantic content, these terms, right? Why? Well. For one, the referential intentions don't line up with descriptions. So take, for example, the term white. Uh, we know from human evolutionary history, human migration history, uh, that people having origins in any of the original peoples of Europe, the Middle East or North Africa, applies to just about the entire human species. Why? Because of out of Africa, uh, OOA, out of Africa, theory of human migration history, where we came from Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, first, tens of thousands of years ago, hit the southern part of Eurasia, maybe crossed the Red Sea, hit Arabia, uh, eventually got to a now extinct uh, continent called Sahol, which is now uh, turned into Australia, uh, New Guinea, and Tasmania, about 50,000 years ago, right? Then we had another huge wave out that led to eventually the colonization of Europe, and eventually through Beringia led to the colonization the Americas 10,000 years after. And so, I mean, unless all of your human ancestors, right, didn't come from any of those two huge migrations, you're gonna be white, right? Even people who are so-called unmixed East Asians, Pacific Islanders, so this is not, this is not the right definition. Okay, a little clarification on the genetics. So the genetic clusters that came was five are widely called human continental populations in the literature, just continental populations, uh, geographic populations at the K plus five level, various 
terms like that. And I actually have a paper uh, trying to give the essences of these particular types of biological populations. It's in Plots of Science, 2016. But uh, to give you a kind of a, a picture of the um, abstentions, I'll just put up some of the results that population geneticists across various papers uh, have come to accept. So you have uh, lots of ethno-linguistic groups with uh, just mixed, right? Uh, on average, in the parentheses, the average genomic ancestries of people in that ethno-linguistic group with respect to this continental population. As so you can get a sense of what the geographic range um, and membership of these fuzzy populations are. Um, I've also defended literature that these are, because if I'm going to take a referential account of the semantics of these terms, um, it would be uh, much easier if the reference existed, and they were real, otherwise you get these problems in Fox language. Um, I do think that they're, I think they're biologically real. Um, I, I'm not putting up my whole theory of uh, biological reality for kinds or particulars. Uh, but I have one, and this is part of it. Uh, this is for uh, what I call properly empirical kinds of particulars in science. Uh, these are sufficient conditions, basically get some relevant epistemic work done of a certain nature in a legitimate uh, science, in this case, life science. <laughs> and so the work that the human continental populations gets done is the following. So say that you do cluster analysis on humans and you get these five clusters at k equals five that seem to correspond to continental groups. It's very robust uh, with some Penn uh, undergraduates actually worked our way through 81 papers over the summer uh, to see the robustness of the original result from Rosenberg et al. in 2002. Um, also, uh, the the most representative sample in order to quantify that I came up with, I used this index of representation that's used in the diversity literature, tweaked it a bit, uh, use it to analyze the geographic sampling representativeness of the studies. And uh, the best study turns out to be Trevor Pemberton et al. Rosenberg is one of the authors on there. Uh, 2003, large number of human ethnolinguistic groups um, and they get the same results as Rosenberg 2002. So this, this is a, a pretty stubborn result. Uh, what's a pretty straightforward explanation of what's going on? We have population structure in a five-fold five -fold way, it corresponds to continental origins. With respect to the field language, um, I, I, don't, I don't think I have to review this that much. Um, piggybacking a fair amount of John Perry's uh, work clarifying uh, referential meanings. All right, so with respect to the argument, the way that I've set up the antecedent and consequent, you basically get the consequent from the antecedent. I'm not gonna spend too much time on that. What's more interesting to see is if the uh, claims may be antecedent, first premise are true. So. The first claim that these terms are singular terms. Well, I think you can get some empirical evidence from that from looking at directive number 15, um, the primary reason that the OMB wanted to regulate race talk among federal agencies um, is to not allow crosstalk. We would do that, make your terms singular terms. Now, with respect to the more substantive premise that um, all the these race terms have unique reference that are human continental populations. Um, I'm going to make that inference abductively, uh, looking at the strongest competing theories in the philosophy of race literature that have been advanced so far. And this is the sort of conceptual terrain. Um, you can have referential uh, theory or non-referential theory of the semantics of these race terms. But you can have a biological theory or non-biological theory. So I'm in this camp with respect to the OMB's race talk 
It's a referential biological theory, uh, but I'll talk about other very strong representatives in the next. Uh, so Michael Levin has a, a race theory. It's really a theory for ordinary English race talk as such. Um, I take OMB race talk to be uh, a sub talk of that. Um, and he has a kind of split semantic theory there. He thinks that there's some descriptive semantic content, but also some referential semantic content. Explicitly, he says that ordinary English races, uh, by definition, are continental or subcontinental clades. That's just what we're talking about. Uh, now, clade is a monophyletic group, um, and that, that doesn't clarify everything because that's talked about differently in literature. But with respect to Levin's work, he's talking about an ancestor and all of its descendants. So um, me and all of my children, so that would, that would be a uh, played or not played. Uh, so now notice what Levin's explanation of the mapping phenomenon would be. It wouldn't be identity. He wouldn't say that Asians and East Asians are the same groups. Uh, it would be something like co-exemplification because there would both be examples of say genealogical population. So in virtue of being races, your continental clades, clades of genealogical populations, right? And then the continental um, uh, populations themselves are of course genomic ancestry groups, which are genealogical populations. And genealogical population, that's a term from uh, Lisa Gannett. She's worked on the different ways of talking about biological populations. <coughs> Now, um, my only concern with this theory is that it doesn't work very well with the OMB's race terms. Uh, in particular, uh, there's very good phylogenetic evidence that Blacks, Pacific Islanders, Asians, Whites are not clays. <clears throat> so this is um, uh, the Pemberton and all study. So this is from the study where we have the most representative sample of the human species in terms of ethnolinguistic groups, uh, the largest sample of ethnolinguistic groups to date. Um, and they do this tree. I know it's kind of hard to tell what's going on, but basically these, these flags here, it's going to tell you where the continental groups start and stop. So the sub-Saharan African uh, populations are here. The so-called Caucasian ones are here. Native American ones are here. East Asians here, Oceanians here. And if you look at the tree, you find that all of these are all of these groups, except for Native Americans, according to the tree, are paraphyletic. Paraphyletic is an ancestor and some, but not all of its descendants. There's a debate in philosophy of systematics about whether paraphyletic groups are real taxa, but I won't get into that. The point is that Levin says that ordinary English races are clays. Uh, here we have examples of ordinary English races that. Uh, mostly not clays. <clears throat> All right. So the theory that works a little better is Austis. Uh, she was in San, she was in San Francisco for a while now. I think she started at Duke. Um, she has this very intriguing uh, general theory of social kinds, and then she applies it. She mostly focuses on sex and gender in the book. The book is called Categories We Live By. But in chapter five, she talks about race. Um, interestingly, Austin and I kind of philosophy of race siblings. Our first philosophy of race courses were under Sally Haslanger at MIT. I was visiting from Tufts. Student, the, the class was like four people. <laughs> she was, so we made up 50% of the class. But um, so I've been uh, following her work for a while. And she came up with this theory that it actually differs from Haslanger's social constructionist theory of race uh, in the following sense. So Haslanger, um, puts the difference of how races are socially constructed um, in a slightly different way. Asta thinks of the social construction as coming from social statuses. Um, the example that she uses a lot in the book, the prime people's intuitions is thinking about the essence of a strike. If you watch baseball and watch enough baseball, uh, what a strike is essentially has nothing was nothing, but it certainly doesn't just come down to something in physics. It's not just some perfect trajectory over the plate. We've obviously seen cases where that's not the case. Um, it's more the status that a, a physical trajectory over the plate of a baseball in a game 
uh, is given by the umpire, the official umpire game, right? And so her view is, and a lot of our social crimes are like that. Um, it looks like they're biological. In this case, she thinks that the OMB races in particular, and she talks about the OMB races specifically in her book. Uh, she thinks that they're tracking geographic ancestry. So this is the metaphysical relation of tracking, relationship between uh, conferred uh, social essences and um, some biological or other natural science stuff that uh, it's, it's kind of following along. <clears throat> and um, so this is how she identifies the essence of, of races in chapter five um, and specifically OMB races. So you've got what say the Asian race is essentially it's a group of people that have a certain kind of social status conferred upon them by the federal government. And it looks like they're geographic ancestry groups, but they're not really. <clears throat> so um, her explanation of the mapping phenomenon would be that uh, really what we're looking at is some function of tracking, it's not identity. Okay, so uh, this is a good theory, except I think my theory is a bit more empirically adequate than hers insofar as it handles Native American or American Indian talk uh, better. So take the claim, it's not possible to be a member of the American Indian race without federally recognized tribal affiliation. Uh, this is actually something that she addresses um, in her chapter. <clears throat> she says, look, if one self identifies as American Indian, but it comes out that one has no affiliation with any tribe. This, this book was published before Elizabeth Warren did her. I know it's both 2018, but this technically came out before that. Uh, but you could think about that case. Uh, but no, if you don't have an affiliation with a particular tribe, the status is revoked. You're not really American Indian, according to Austin. And that, to be fair, was a bit of the debate that people were having with respect to Warren. It's like, look, do you have tribal affiliation? No, shut up. No amount of DNA is going to show that you're American Indian, right? And some other people were saying, no, 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 you need us to have some answers. Okay. Of course, uh, my theory doesn't require any tribal membership to be American Indian for the federal government. Uh, so an example of where we would disagree is also would say Mestizo, Hispanic Americans who have no tribal affiliation aren't really American Indian, no one race talk. I would say, yes, they are if they have uh, Native American genomic ancestry. Um, okay, so the question, so the only issue is what would the OMB say? The OMB doesn't weigh in on this directly, but we can infer uh, their sort of referential intent from the behaviors of the federal agencies that defer to the OMB. Uh, so we can look at, for example, the US Census Bureau, what they do. And since 2000, uh, this data is from 2010. You can also see it in 2020 uh, results. Um, there's lots of Mexican Americans that self-report American Indian and have absolutely no tribal affiliation to give. <clears throat> and the Census Bureau does not reject their self-report. Instead, they came up with new jargon. They called it Mexican American Indian. And that group turns out to be the fourth most populous uh, group of American Indians in the United States according to the official counts. Uh, this is actually a significant result. Some people think, well, doesn't the Census Bureau just accept what your self-report is anyway? No. The Census Bureau rejects millions of self-reports every census. And in fact, um, they say that they do to be in accordance with OMB standards, right? So if you say, well, I really don't feel like I'm white, I'm Arab. Like, nope, you're white. They'll change your answer. Now, they do this with computers, but when it gets to tough cases, they actually use human beings. I want to apply for one of those jobs. So he's like, oh, you know, you can get down in the dirt there. But we'll see. All right. Another way of thinking about what the OMB's race terms mean is descriptively but biologically. So this is uh, nicely captured by Michael Hardiman's theory. He specifically talks about the OMB's racial scheme in his most recent book, uh, Re uh, Rethinking Race, came out um, in 2017. <clears throat> and how does he think about the way that we talk about race in, officially he says ordinary English, the dominant race talk in ordinary English, but specifically for the OMB, basically they're visible morphological geographic ancestry groups. That's how 
he thinks we're talking. <laughs> so um, he wouldn't be an identity theorist for the mapping phenomenon. He specifically says in chapter four that I'm wrong of his book. He says, no, the Spencer's not right. These are not the same groups. Uh, but he says they uh, exemplify the same kind of thing. So for example, the black race in OMB race talk and the African uh, continental population uh, would both be examples of minimalist races. That's what, that's what Hardiman argues for in the book. <clears throat> so uh, my reply to this though, is let's, let's test this against um, this, this proposition. Uh, say it's not possible that the Pacific Island race doesn't satisfy C1. Um, of course, if you're a race, a minimalist race in, in ordinary English race talk, you've got to satisfy C1 for Hardiman. Uh, my theory says, nope, it's not necessary. How you look is not relevant for racial, uh, being a race uh, for the OMB. It's about your ancestry. <clears throat> and I can generate a, a fairly accessible possible world uh, to show that this is, this is metaphysically possible. So imagine a, a population bottleneck for the human species where the only humans that are left are Sub-Saharan Africans and Melanesians. What would that world look like? Well, it looks like what Homo sapiens looked like for most of our existence, to be quite frank, <laughs> up until about 20,000 years ago. Uh, we all look like Sub-Saharan Africans. Right? <clears throat> and these would be uh, the Sub-Saharan Africans on the slide and the Melanesians on the slide right here. <clears throat> so this is a, a, a fact that race theorists have known uh, and anthropologists for many years. The question is, uh, what would the OMB say? Well, again, we can look at the behavior of the federal agencies to get a sense of that. Uh, where do they put Melanesians? Do they think of Melanesians as black people? Do they think of them as Pacific Islands? They think of them as Pacific Islands. Over and over again, they count Melanesians with Pacific Islanders, not blacks. And you know, they're very detailed and specific with how they sort of sort people with the race code base. So I don't think that that theory matches up to premise three either. Uh, the last I'll consider is uh, Paul Taylor's. So this is from a uh, revised edition of his 2004 book, Race and Introduction. It's not really an introductory, I mean, it kind of is, it's a monograph, it just has that sort of title. Um, and in it, he argues that uh, American, popular American races and specifically federal government's races are uh, radically constructive races. So he's a social constructionist about these races and um, he uh, is a scriptivist. So what are these groups? Oh, I should also say he came out with a third edition of this book earlier this year and he still holds on to everything I'm gonna to touch on. Although he, this, to get the book, it's a fabulous sort of uh, uh, back and forth between contemporary race theories. Um, but what is a radically constructive race? So this is a probabilistic to define human population as a result of from the white supremacist discrimination. Then like appearance and answers to social location and life chances. Um, he's very serious about this appearance and ancestry uh, constraint. I'm gonna focus on the appearance constraint. Really, I think he's more of a biosocial uh, race theorist. Low Collins, someone who calls themselves a social constructionist, a bias, that's kind of fighting words on that. But um, so that's the view. And so he would disagree that the best of what's going on with the mapping phenomenon is identity. At best, he would say it's something like coextension. So what's, what are you looking at when you're looking at um, sort of Blacks and, and uh, Sub Saharan Africans? Uh, let's say you're looking at. Uh, current groups of people that are pretty much the same, but then the essences of the groups are different. Okay, so uh, this might work for some of the race, race terms of the OMB, but it doesn't work for Pacific Islander. Uh, there's just not uh, some kind of way that Pacific Islanders look such that you can attach some higher probabilistic likelihood of, 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 of certain kinds of life chances onto. And Pacific Islanders haven't looked a certain way since the people who would be 
the white supremacists who racialized them, which in the book are European colonists. Uh, European colonists first got to Oceania in the 1520s. It was New Guinea and Micronesia and um, I think Mariana Island specifically. And uh, even since then, Pacific Islanders have looked radically different. Uh, so you have Melanesian was basically, um, it's very hard to tell the difference between Melanesian and Sub-Saharan Africans. They make up the overwhelming majority of Pacific Islanders actually. And they have Polynesians and Micronesians which basically look like brown skinned East Asian, East Asians, which will be relevant for the phenomenon that I'll talk about later. Um, so um, I think that my theory uh, gets the, uh, the phenomena uh, most right. And so I can infer the identity thesis claim. Now talk about some interesting implications and applications. So there's a couple of them. I'll just narrow it down to two that I think might be interesting to talk about. Uh, one metaphysical implication for race theory. So I'm gonna actually use this result together with another chapter that bootstrap up evidence for what I call radical racial pluralism. So basically, if the identity thesis is right, and this is one race talk in the US, not the only race talk, remember the meaning of these terms are the reference, there's no sort of unified theory of race for Americans. Instead, we have a plurality of essences for what race is. I call this uh, uh, essence pluralism. I have a grad student working on existence pluralism um, for uh, race theory. <clears throat> and um, I don't know that more evidence is needed. That's, that's, the, that's the job of the book. Um, but that is a radically different way of giving an answer to the question, what is race? So an example of how to answer a question like, well, who are Asians essentially? Like, what are the membership conditions for being Asian? Um, well, I'd say it depends on the race talk in the United States. Uh, it could be your genomic ancestry. So South Asians, Central Asians, East Asians, will all be Asian. Um, or it could be a matter of your visible morphological grouping uh, so that would include um, not uh, South Asians, but um, uh, Polynesians, Micronesians, East Asians, and actually Arctic Native Americans. <clears throat> so it depends. Um, in OMB race talk, um, you would have one answer for that. And I think this is another race talk in the US that has to be wrestled with, I call it US hate speech. Um, I think there's a good case to be made that they're just a visible morphological grouping. What's the empirical evidence for this? Well, if you look at the wonderful evidence Americans have been giving race theorists since the pandemic started, uh, the anti-Asian hate incidents and hate crimes, uh, there was a huge, huge uh, report that came out um, not too long ago. And you can look at who are the people on the receiving end of this so-called anti-Asian hate um, the East Asians, Polynesians, Micronesians, not South Asians. All right. And so this is an example of, of the data. Uh, so Chamorro, Guam, that's a part of US territory. Lots of uh, Chamorro Americans in uh, California, actually. So, you know, Americans are who they are. You look like a brown skinned Chinese. It's all your fault. Right. So, um, that pluralist way of thinking about race is currently where I'm at. Now, what kind of value can a pluralist race theory have for a practicing scientists, practicing life scientists? Well, um, it's an unfinished theory, but part of the theory is gonna be this so-called OMB race theory. And um, I have the smack content of those race terms uh, down pat. So, we can see the utility here because there's a federal law that requires NIH-funded clinical researchers to sample racial minorities in a way to reliably detect medically relevant racial differences. Uh, the person who's actually held, um, who's, who gets punished um, for, make, for not 
uh, ensuring this is the director of the NIH. The NIH, since the early 2000s, have required, in order to you know, make it precise who these racial minorities are, um, they required exactly the OMB's racial scheme, the 1997 racial scheme. So now it becomes um, very useful to know essentially what are these groups? That'll tell you what racial membership is and what your measurement theory uh, uh, should be in order to reliably uh, identify people of the of those races. Unfortunately, we're just using self-report. Now, self-report is, you know, very, started off 99% this, blah, blah, blah. Yes, it's very good in the aggregate, but if you're talking about sampling the human species at most 30,000 people, that's typically what a cl clinical study looks like. Um, these small, and I'll talk about a couple of them, two of them, these small, uh, aberrations in self-report can actually have huge effects on your sample. You can think you're getting a representative sample of the species and you're not. <clears throat> so some examples of that, there are cases, specific uh, medical studies I can point to, said, hey, we wanna get more non-Caucasian uh, uh, descended gene, uh, uh, chromosomal segments into our sample, right? And they sample a group that mostly self-reports in a way that goes against that. Say, okay, we'll, we'll sample these, um, uh, we'll go in an area where um, we wanna get all these white folks and it turns out that people who, um, I'm sorry, we go in an area that we think we're gonna get all these Native American folks, not self-reporting as Native American, or actually self-reporting as white, like Ms. Tizo, Mexicans tend to do, um, and then you mess up your sample. Uh, also, South Asians are very, very mixed, mostly Caucasian. Um, you can actually end up with too much Caucasian genomic segments in your sample if you focus your sampling on South Asian Asians when you're sampling Asians. So um, I actually think that medical researchers should move away from self-report. I know it's very easy, um, but it actually brings with it a lot of problems. Um, and in fact, I mean, there's specific data we can talk about, about how significant the undersampling of racial minorities is in NIH-funded medical research, regardless of the fact that it's the law that it shouldn't be that way. Um, but how can we get out of this? Well, expert reporting. Uh, one way to do it is if you're thinking of, well, I wanna figure out, I wanna get more diverse sets of alleles in my uh, uh, sample because maybe this, this drug that we're developing has a different way of metabolizing in different bodies, uh, then you probably want to do what I call sigma counting. Fuzzy set theory is just how many people in a set do you have, add up the membership grades, right? And then uh, you can do alpha counting after you know, um, you know, sort of what you're looking for. You're trying to figure out explanations. Say, well, I'm going to take all the people who have at least this much percent ancestry, and then I can study them. Now, an example of where both of those ways of counting were actually done, um, and we actually made some really good discoveries, is this study that happened partially in California, partially in my home state of Tennessee. Um, there was a study on the most prominent, most, most widely uh, uh, experienced cancer in children in the United States, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And they had a hypothesis, these researchers, that the standard chemotherapy for this cancer uh, didn't work very well in Native Americans, right? So the question becomes, well, how do you sample the American public such that you get a high enough sample of people with Native American ancestry um, so that you can detect a difference if a difference exists, right? And there's statistics equations you can use to get that number. Uh, but one thing that you're going to really need to do is not pay too much attention to people's self-reports uh, because large swaths of Ms. Tizo Hispanics do not self-report uh, Native American. So what they did was, yeah, they got a lot of tribal members and then just threw in a lot of mestizos. Yeah, we're putting you in here. And that's what they did. And then when they did that, they had a large enough sample of people with Native American ancestry uh, to find two things. First, there was, if you thought of Native American ancestry as continuous variable, uh, you can see uh, continuous sort of connection 
between your amount of Native American genomic ancestry and your risk of relapse after one round of the typical chemotherapy for this cancer. Um, the specifics are up there. And then if you thought of like in an alpha counting ways, they found it's like, well, you look at the graph, basically if you have at least 10% Native American genomic ancestry, then you get most of this effect. <clears throat> and so they said, okay, we'll zoom in on this group of people and they found uh, two, actually a couple more, but these are two most prominent alleles uh, that were known to be involved in the metabolic pathways of the drugs that are typically included in the chemotherapy. The, act, the solution was actually pretty simple. They just gave these people a second round of chemotherapy. And they were saving lives. Lives that they wouldn't have been able to save if they just relied on self-reports. They wouldn't have had the statisticals. They wouldn't have been able to see it because there wouldn't be statistically significant results for the Native American population. Native Americans are widely undersampled in medical research. All right, thank you very much. Um, Right. I'm in complete agreement with that. I'm a pluralist. Uh, so I actually think that, and I'm writing a paper with uh, one of my former students who's a, a bioethicist now, um, about sort of um, promoting this paradigm shift among uh, medical researchers and bioethicists to think about the racial disparities in health problems pluralistic, right? Um, even in genetics because we know that there can be um, uh, sort of non-genetic causes of genetic differences. And so I think that uh, even geneticists should be sampling, not just by your genomic ancestry, but also by other ways that we racially classify that can have an impact, say, in epigenetic ways. Thank you so much. Oh. I ask you how how do you kind of accommodate for say talk of mixed race uh, stuff uh, in your kind of pluralist uh, identification because on the face of it it doesn't seem that identity even if you use some kind of free logic can do this kind of mixed stuff. Yeah. So um, again, as a pluralist, I mean it depends on the race talk, uh, but within the federal government's race talk, I would say there's lots of uh, especially Americans, but people across the world uh, who are mixed race. And the degree of their mixture is quantifiable uh, by the degree of genomic ancestry. Because in my theory, it's, it's a one to one. That's your degree of membership in a race is your degree of genomic ancestry. In a race. Oh, okay. So you would use officially sigma counting, but um, again, pragmatically for, say, this cancer study, so you're basically. People with at least ten percent—that's the—that's the interesting part. You can count that for us. But how, how does you would imagine? Because you said that it it, de it depends on the different contexts, right? And different kind of contexts you evaluate. So, uh, if if you evaluate evaluate the identity on different contexts, and you get different results, but you base that on the same kind of genomic data. Oh, oh, no. Oh, okay. no, 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 no. That, that example was just for the context of OMB race talk. But if, um, say, in US hate speech, if I'm, if I'm right that uh, these are visible morphological groupings, then I would have to think more carefully about what racial membership amounts to in that race talk. And that's the way yes. we should be counting people. Sandy? Thank you, Kweisha. That was really interesting. And as you know, probably I am a pluralist and I'm interested in pushing a little bit on that. How do you determine, I guess you've now shifted the problem in a way, in an interesting way to determining 
the, con the, the context that changed the categorization. So I'm wondering um, if you have any kind of advice about um, different contexts and whether, when and whether they should be separated. Because I, I guess what I'm I, behind this question, let me come with the real issue, is when would you be in a position to challenge the LMB racial classification as opposed to figure out how, what makes sense of racial classification in it? In, in that context, when would you be in a position to challenge the rate, the uh, not just accept the kind of toxic speech classifications that people who don't see genes or ancestry or anything uh, use? I mean, I mean, one step is to understand it, but on what basis can you challenge those classifications? Good. Um... They are reviewing their classification right now, actually. <laughs> they, were, they were doing that at the tail end of the Obama administration. Um, basically, every 20 years, they, they review uh, their official racial classification for you know, how well is it working and so forth. Um, and they were doing it. And then Trump got elected. And he was, nope, we're keeping it. Right? And one of my colleagues said, yeah, of course. That's a good way to... Make America white again. You can just look how inclusive the white category is. Right? But anyway, um, <coughs> that's, all right, this is a good thing. <laughs> um, but yeah, those those conversations are are happening. They're going to ramp up because um, uh, Biden wants us to revisit uh, the official racial scheme for the twenty thirty uh, census um, and. I mean, there are academics who are involved in the process. Um, I mean, we'll see. They're talking about finally including Hispanics in the racial scheme somehow. They're talking about making the white category less inclusive. There's all kinds of interesting um, discussions going on. Now, officially, I consider that part of the sort of semantic engineering part of philosophy of race. I'm doing more of a descriptive project of how are we talking about race um, I didn't come up with these. A different project is how should we come up with these? Um, Sally Haslanger has been very influential in getting us to think about uh, race theory in that respect. Um, so, um, but to have any influence on what the federal government is doing, you got to be in the room. And it turns out, interestingly, um, you had 30 plus federal agencies in the room on a committee because that's what we do. We come with committees and big bureaucracy. <clears throat> and they were responsible for making recommendations on B in 1995. Um, the committee included lots of federal agencies, but the groups that were controlling the discussion were the Census Bureau, National Institutes of Health uh, Department, uh, the Vital Statistics uh, Department, Centers for Disease Control. A lot of the health and life sciences agencies were controlling the discussion. You can see it in the official, it's in the Federal Register. Uh, so those talk about Hispanics before they shot it down. Too heterogeneous for health research. Right. So this is, this is what they came up with, I think, in part because of the concerns of the CDC and the NIH and what would be good categories for their research. Um, but, you know, um, you know maybe uh, the conversation will go differently. Uh, we'll see. But um, you would have to be in the room because they're they're doing it. <laughs> they're doing it right now. But the second, there's a second part. Um, this is more of meta metaphysics. What I'm trying to do, I am trying to get fossils of race to think differently, kind of get a paradigm shift going, where you have all these different monist race theories. So this is how we talk about race. No, 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 no. This is how we talk about race. Instead, I'm trying to get fossils. Think it's this or this? Is this or this or this? Is this or this or this or this? That's a whole different way of doing race theory. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. Um, this is sort of related to Kimmy's question, but so I was wondering with the MR list. So is the first sort of definition that you were giving for race, the kind of more realistic definition, seemed kind of intentional and had this very 
clear, you know, at the end, it's the case that you just misclassify yourself, right? Like self reports can just be wrong. Um, there is a fact about what race I fall into, and I can be getting it. And then when we think about the kind of way that you're classifying stuff like American hate speech, it seems a lot more extensional. Like it's just, it seems like the person who's the target of the hate speech or how the race is used is just matched with the extension of who it's used on, right? And it seems like in some sense, you are Asian American in that in the hate speech sense, if you're being discriminated against in virtue of hate speech or something. And I'm wondering about sort of like tensions in the scientific applications of those different kinds of definitions um, and like how you want to collect different sampling, specifically in the extensional kind of definition, like if you're worried about how microaggression and stuff affects bodily processes and like how would you even know how to sample for that? Or is it, would, it, would it even matter to you race talk? Would it just be like, have you experienced these kinds of discriminations? Or could it be the case that people of certain races are experiencing them and not recognizing them, but still keeping track of them physically? And then how would you track for that if your definition is extensional? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, there's measurement problems. Um, I'll say the first part, I, I don't actually, I, I don't actually think that the, how other people see you as what your race is, uh, works in US hate speech. Uh, and I'll give an example, some empirical evidence. Uh, take uh, Rachel Dolezal. Right. So this is a problem for the social constructors, actually, because I mean, people. Let me let me just summarize the case real quick. So she was a uh, African professor in Washington, who was also the uh, director of the local NAACP. She went to a HBCU for her college work, and uh, she presented as an African American woman. She self-identified as an African American woman. Um, she actually came to fame because she was a part-time professor. She was traveling over to Idaho and she was getting, uh, according to her, pulled over for a DWB, driving while black, uh, by the police. She made a claim against them, local police uh, in Spokane, 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 Washington, uh, found, not local police, local media, found out that she was claiming another black man as her father on Facebook. And, but then, Somebody let it slip that her parents were Caucasian or something. And so they asked her on air, are you African American? She walked off air. And then America just bubbled into an obsession with this woman's racial membership. And um, there were uh, surveys that were done. Uh, for example, the YouGov survey 2015, that's when this all unfolded. Uh, it showed the wide majority of Americans thought that Rachel Dahl Dolezal isn't black, was never black, and will never be black. <laughs> and when you delved into it, they thought it was biological ancestry. Um, now, if you're a social constructionist who thinks that the way you're treated constitutes, so your social position constitutes your racial membership, like say Sally Hazard's racialized group theory of race, uh, they have a problem there empirically because the, the, the data, the, the people are telling you, no, that was a mistake. It wasn't the fact that she was ever a black woman. It was a mistake that we ever thought she was a black woman. She was passing, right? That's supposed to be the phenomenon of passing. Social construction theories have a hard time traditionally dealing with the phenomenon of passing. Uh, so actually, I don't think it works. Uh, this how people see you is what your race is works very well for uh, discrimination situations exactly because of the empirical evidence we have about how people judge errors, right? Um, now, that's not to say you take everything at face value in the survey, but um, you got to have some empirical basis. Um, so I think it's still, there's a couple other theories that have a good chance of explaining what we're doing in U.S. hate speech. Um, the one that I talked about was Josh Glasgow's theory. Um, so, so far, my pluralist U.S. race theory is um, I've got the, the case for the OMB, Glasgow's got hate speech right and so forth. Um, but, you know, there are contenders. There could be uh, rival theories there. But yeah, there's a measurement problem. Like you have to, if you don't know what it is you're measuring, you're going to have a hard time reliably measuring. 
I'm just wondering about the advice for life sciences. I mean, I, I guess presumably it's harder when you test something that doesn't depend on what relatively practical properties you could have for measurement. And I think it's a, a huge advantage of self report is just that you can assess it extremely quickly, extremely up and down the basis of it. I mean, what just, just the practical level, what are the possible so called alternative proxies? And, and there's ethical considerations. So, so for a long time, the, the Census Bureau and the federal government, there was no self-report. They would have an enumerator come to your house and they'd write down what your race was according to uh, the current government standards. And you know, offended a lot of people and so forth and blah, 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 blah. So they, they do have this other ethical dimension where they want to use techniques that respect people's autonomy and all sorts of stuff. But you want good data. And if you want to get, <laughs> if you want to get a good sample of allele, alleles, for medically relevant uh, 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 parts of the genome, then you know, um, self report has has known drawbacks. Um, but I think that eventually this problem will be kind of solved by current trends. Uh, the largest repository of genetic information of people in the world right now is 23andMe. You're doing it. <laughs> You're helping out geneticists. They've got more data than any other single repository, as far as I'm aware. Um, and so they'll they'll be able to have pretty quick access to your genomic ancestry if you know, certain legal hurdles or something. But I, I think that the direction of medical science is kind of going in that direction. Whether you like it or not. <laughs> Yeah. I was wondering, so you talk about sort of hate speech and also the OMP. I mean, I'm wondering, is there sort of something between that, like folk everyday, kind of folk race, spa? I mean, it seemed like Levin was maybe talking about this. Mm -hmm. It seems like a lot of times you have these folk race categories that aren't necessarily being used in hate speech, um, but aren't, you're not like you know, sensitive to that. And, and I was wondering if you thought about those at all. Um, oh, yeah. 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 So there is a sort of metaphilosophical dispute between me and my interlocutors. Uh, if you read what is race for philosophical views, it's kind of going on in the background. Um, and this is a, it's a bit of a dispute about what is ordinary race talk, right? So say Josh Glasgow responds to my work and says, you know, that works for the OMB. That's a specialist technical sort of, is that what the ordinary folk are doing, right? The way I think about ordinary race talk is race talk that is experienced in everyday American life. And if you want to get a, a loan from an American bank, 95% uh, of the time, you're going to have to fill out the uniform residential um, uh, mortgage loan application, which by Fannie and Freddie Mac requires your, self, your not even self-report, just the report of the races of the borrowers. If you don't put it in, the loan officer has to put it in. <laughs> right. um, also, uh, the primary race talk that's used in college admissions is the OMBs with uh, some of my researchers. Uh, we looked at all the ranked schools in US News World Reports. Um, <clears throat> so we really, we're focused on affirmative action, so which is selective uh, sort of American college and universities. And um, there's hundreds of them, 98.9% .9 of them collected racial information on applicants by the OMB's race talk specific. That's for a very straightforward sociological reason. Uh, the Department of Education says if you want, since 2007, if you want our money, you've got to report data about the race and ethnicity of your students and faculty. In order, and you, you got to do it in OMB's way, right? And so that's a very powerful one. Universities want money from the Department of Education. So, so you know, um, if you're applying for college, you're getting food stamps, you're applying for a mortgage loan, I consider that to be part of ordinary race talk, federal governments, because of how much power and influence they have. Um, well, the philosophers don't. I think it's, it's kind of some kind of, uh, it's just this ground, ground up grassroots folk race talk. And really, I think that's the wrong way to think about it. But there is that meta sort of thing going on there. Thanks. I just want to follow up on this uh, admissions 
uh -huh. college admissions point that you just made because iPads actually now has a different system they or an additional that they have mixed race is another category and then they also have Hispanic non-Hispanic and anyone who but so when when you report to iPads if you're either in not if you're in Hispanic then none of the other races none of the races count you're Hispanic right um and so this is very uh, complicated for mm -hmm. reporting so mixed race for instance i was just looking at a graph of um, i think that came in about 2012 and uh the numbers mm -hmm. of uh, black african americans has dropped significantly mm -hmm. because mixed race has gone up and uh, at least that's what i'm assuming do you know which universities are using this this uh, uh, application uh, well ours is but oh, um, good. It okay. is, yeah i mean i think it's it, ipads is a requirement of the department of education for uh, federal grants from the department of education um okay i'll take a look at that that's interesting yeah. um, and, and so it's very complicated when you talk about the diversity of your student body mm -hmm. um and so ongoing debates um with our uh, especially with our Black Alumni Association, about why, you know, wondering why are the number of Black African Americans dropping at the university? Was it counting? <laughs> because we can't say, yeah. you know, even if somebody says they're white and Black or Asian and Black, they can only count in the mixed race. They can't count. Oh, Asian black. okay. So I, I think this, it, you know, I don't know what this talk is. I yeah, think yeah. It's like education speech. So I, I think I, I don't actually think that it has to do with the semantics. That, that's actually a rule that the um, the OMB uses for uh, helping the relevant federal agencies to enforce civil rights law. So mm -hmm. there's there's a rule where if someone reports as mixed race, uh, you've got to report the minority race. That's the rule. They're not saying that that's your only race, but that's just how the information gets cataloged for the purposes of enforcing civil rights. So that could be what's going on, but I'll take a, a closer well, look at this particular situation. Yeah, actually, we can't count. If somebody says white and black, we can count them as neither white nor black, but only as mixed race. Oh, I see. Yeah, that's okay. not the OMB. <laughs> Yeah, the CDC specifically didn't want mixed race. They talked about that in 1995. Well, so you, you lose data that way. Like, there's lots of people who are mixed. I'm mixed. Um, I, uh, Barack Obama, Kamala Harris. I mean, they're very famous people, you know, who presumably would pick exactly those two categories. Yeah, well, that's interesting. I mean, that would dovetail with pluralism. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't be saying, look, there's like one exact way of talking about race and admissions or anywhere else, um, there's, there's probably a plurality of ways. When we when we did the count, it was the 2016 uh, U.S. Census, um, not U.S. Census, um, U.S. News and World Reports uh, rankings. Um, so there, there could have been some movements. There was spe specifically some, there was some interesting variations even with that data set. Um, there were some univers, there was at least one university that separated out Southeast and Northeast Asians because they, there's an interesting phenomenon there that people who are relevant know about the education situation there, uh, why you might want to separate that out. But um, yeah, some universities do things slightly differently. Um, the University of Texas system actually didn't use the home base. Uh, so that was the last affirmative action case. And that was actually part of the problem because I think it was Alito or something that was like what? What are y'all using? I don't know. We don't, we don't actually have an institutional, right? So they, they weren't actually using a single uh, racial scheme. Now they're using one of these racial scheme, but um, pretty soon no one will be able to use any racial scheme because the Supreme Court is going to shoot down from the Thank you. So my question is about your back to your account of Owen race talk in particular and how to understand this concept of ancestry that mm -hmm. you're using in it. So if I'm understanding the methods, these uh, statistical methods correctly, they're producing, the clusters are kind of emerging from the data 
and the methods that you're using in some way. So it seems like they don't necessarily represent like populations that existed in time and space at some point. Like there weren't necessarily five populations that we could pick out at some point in the evolutionary past that represent the five clusters. Um, am I is that am I understanding that correctly about the method? They're a little, I guess well, what I'm saying is there's sort of abstractions in some sense. Those oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. There's always abstractions in scientific modeling. Right. Uh, there are assumptions about the uh, hardy vine equilibrium populations. Each cluster has to be infinitely sized and randomly mating. That's obviously right. two false uh, assumptions. So, so then, um, if those those cluster those populations that are represented in the clusters are sort of abstractions in some way, what does it mean to say that these are real groups in which we good. have full or partial membership? If they don't, we can't sort of say they existed here at this time. And space. Um, I, I do think that they're real in the sense of having concrete existence um, with my theory of biological reality of kinds and particulars. Uh, but that objection in particular, I addressed in a field studies paper, 2018. Um, how can you use these ideal models to identify concrete realities? Science does that all the time. So think about how we identify Neptune. We use very idealized models about the orbits of planets, um, you know, the perfect circles, and they have the constant um, acceleration and so forth. And yet we think that there's a hunk of rock out there that satisfies the planet. Right. Um, so I guess, my, but my question though, and so yeah, I totally find with using idealization. It's just like, we think there's a hunk of rock out there, but we, like, we don't, do we think that there's a Caucasian like group out there, or was it out? Where is it? If it's out there, right? That that we are approximating. Uh, um, a lot. Uh, there's a lot of it in here, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> so these are. I, would, I call these in, fuzzy, in fuzzy biological populations. They're they start off as uh, these breeding groups, and they can persist as genealogical uh, populations. Uh, so right now, the membership conditions would be. Uh, determined by your genomic ancestry, but of course that's not sufficient for articulated membership conditions of the first uh, Black Africans, or the first Caucasians, and so forth. Uh, but no, these are no, these are groups that are considered to be real biological populations among human population genesis. Uh, in fact, if you picked up a theoretical population of biology from Hartle and Clark, it's a popular popular genetics textbook. It will have the Rosenberg et al. results. Uh, as accepted results in population genetics. Um, so <clears throat> these are, I think your, your philosophical theory uh, needs to be able to uh, make sense of uh, the robust and replicated results of mature sciences. And if your metaphysics goes against that, I think you've got a problem. So that's how I respond. Ethics. Okay, so I'm not making that any recommendation in particular about how uh, geneticists and other life scientists who use uh, uh, these racial schemes. I mean, I'm not saying they should use it or shouldn't use it, but if they're going to use it, I have some recommendations about getting reliable information about who's in which group and so forth. But I mean, the point that you're raising is like, well, you know, there's there's a history to consider about um, uh, talking about races in a biologically meaningful way in the life sciences, and that history isn't um, uh, very flattering in a lot of the history of biology. Uh, shouldn't we be wary of this? It's like, well, I mean, you could still, according to my theory, you could still use the groups without using the language. 
So you say, well, I'm going to call these groups. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to give them some technical. This is going to be A135469. And I use that as a, a term for Caucasian because using the term Caucasian is going to be offensive. Uh, if you're still using the group, you're still, my theory is th this is what the groups are. Uh, so you still would be using the races even if you didn't use the language. Um, and that would just be a historically true fact, however long you're sampling the human species with this population scheme. Um, but there are relevant ethical issues to consider about not just how to use the language, if you're going to use it, um, what to use it on. Um, maybe you want to change the, the, the racial scheme and use a different racial scheme. Um, this, I think, is all right future research for bioethicists. Uh, just get your answers in before the federal government's done wrapping up what it's going to do for the 2030 uh, census. That's that's wonderful research. We have to let Ingo have our last question, but we all have a reception afterwards, so there's more time for, for talking to the patient. Yeah, so when um, making a case for the mapping relation being one of identity, you ruled out certain alternatives such as co exemplification and uh, tracking. And of course, a lot of race, uh, like Hardimon, uh, Taylor, Asta, who kind of suggest these alternative uh, relations. And in a nutshell, my question is to what extent are these alternatives um, genuine opponents? who, um, as you do specifically, um, ask your, um, you about the metaphysics of your particular um, mapping relation, the motivation for the question is that your arguments, you present concrete cases and say that the pastor would say this. However, in this case, the OMB would say or has said um, something um, uh, different. Um, so effectively, just like uh, more philosophers do ethics, by asking what would Jesus do, you're doing metaphysics by asking what would an OMB um, say. So, in, in especially with people um, like um, Asta um, or even Taylor, um, um, to what extent um, are they specifically talking about the kind of um, OMB? Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, to what extent is Asta's tracking conferralist accounts specifically about um, OMB and OMB talk only. Good. But she certainly would be, she seems to be a conferralist about everything. Too, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, then she would be a conferralist. Um, good. That's why I wanted to be really careful about my interlocutors. Um, I think that's, that's, a, that's a legitimate concern about the Michael uh, Levin. Uh, work I engage with. He doesn't specifically, as far as I know, talk about the OMB. Mm -hmm. It's about ordinary English race talk, which, if I'm right about OMB race talk being ordinary English race talk, then it's relevant. Uh, but what the others don't, they specifically talk about the office management budget. There's a substantial portion of Austin's chapter five, mm -hmm. which is about office management. But I think for Austin in particular, like she just became naturalized, she's Icelandic, um, now she's American. And again, like if this, this, I think it's ordinary race talk because if you want to become naturalized in the United States, you're going to be, you're going to be using this race talk. <laughs> you'd be using all these race talk. So it was very salient to her. And so, um, and because of the importance of the race talk is probably why she spent so much time on it in chapter five. Uh, but no, they all specifically talk about it. Um, yeah, as I said, Hardiman says Quayshon Spencer is wrong in chapter four <laughs> about OMB race talk. So that's well, all relevant. Let's thank Quayshon for a great talk. Please join us uh, for some refreshments and more conversation. As I said, Hardiman says. I think you must agree with